Um, our speaker tonight, Nick Canis, has been a member of SFAA since 1977. He served as a board member in the early 80s. He's a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society of London. He's collected antiquarian celestial maps for over 40 years and has given talks on celestial cartography to amateur and professional groups. He's published articles on celestial cartography in magazines and journals and has written two celestial map related books, Solar System Maps from Antiquity to the Space Age and Star Maps, History, Artistry, and Cartography. He's a UCSF professor of psychiatry. He was a NASA funded principal investigator studying psychosocial issues involving astronauts. And a few years ago, he gave us a lecture on that topic. And cosmonauts also in space were being discussed. He's a co-author of the textbook Space Psychology and Psychiatry, and more recently the author of Humans in Space, The Psychosocial Hurdles. Both books received Life Science Book Awards from the International Academy of, Astronomic, of Astronomics, Astronautics. He has also published three science fiction novels, The New Martians, The Protos Mandate, The Caloris Network, and is currently working on a screenplay. Um, he's going to, we're going to discover tonight how the history of celestial cartography has evolved in ways relevant for today's amateur astronomer. He'll explain how the development and use of the telescope has influenced mapping, along with other significant developments that many amateur astronomers simply take for granted. Join me in welcoming Nick Canis. There's, there's a flyer, and, and he's got some copies of the, of the books that he was talking about, and one recently published is apparently very, very beautifully illustrated. <clears throat> and there's a bit of a discount tonight, if anyone's interested. Yeah, I brought a few copies, and uh, this flyer, if you get a discount, uh, also from the, the publisher. The one that's the hardback is third edition, and it's in hardback, so which I'm delighted because it really came out nicely. So you're welcome to take a look and take a flyer. I have a few extras if anyone wants to get one tonight. Okay, so who are you? How many of you are observational astronomers who have used a telescope where you sit around and punch it into the computer that does all the work for you? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you are observational astronomers in the old days who don't have a computer on your telescope and have to star hop? Hooray! Okay. How many of you aren't observing astronomers that are here because you like the lecture? Okay. Some of you then may not know some things, so I, I'm going to try and cover kind of both sides of the people who kind of know the sky and people who don't yet. And how many of you came in because it's cold outside? <laughs> None of you admit that. Okay, well, at least, at least I think you're here because you're interested. I feel a lot of pressure now because I know that depending on how you like this talk, it depends how much you donate. That's what you said. Okay, so uh, even if you don't like the talk, please donate. I don't want to feel too bad when there's two cents in there. Okay, so what I'm, how to get involved with this is Linda suggested I have a lot of interest. Basically, I'm a space cadet uh, going way back when I was a little boy, and I was very interested in, in, in actually a show called Space Cadet, and also on TV, and also uh, in science fiction. Um, but the, what hooked me was when Sputnik went up. Uh, I went out on a bluff to look at Sputnik coming over our house in Portland, Oregon, and saw it, actually saw the the stage of the rock that was with it, that was glistening. But that's where Sputnik was. And some fellow had a telescope. And I wandered over on my bike to see uh, what he was looking at, and he was looking at Saturn. And I was absolutely mesmerized with that. I was 11 years old, uh, not nearly as precocious as the young man who got the telescope tonight, who was 10, but I got enchanted, and then the following Christmas got my first telescope, and I was off and running. So I'm interested in space stuff. I'm interested in, in, in uh, star maps. I did work with NASA. I was interested in, in observing, and I've been observing for a long time. Not so much lately because it's cold and I'm getting older, but nevertheless, I'm, I have an interest in the sky. This interest started because in my day, like most of you, uh, I learned to star hop because in those days, my C8 did not have a computer with it. And so you learn you want to see things that are distant, you look through your finder and you find a star that anybody can see, and then you go to the next fainter star and the next fainter star, and sooner or later, 
you then look through your telescope, you find the nebula or the naked eye, the, the, uh, the deep sky object by that way. The process, I learned about the sky. I learned what the constellations were. I had a feeling for the sky. And I started getting interested because I had a star atlas that I used uh, to help me guide. And I'll show you some of those near the end of the talk. Um, and little by little, I started getting interested in the history and in collecting. So I started collecting star maps from old atlases. And that's kind of what I'm going to be focusing on tonight. What I hope to do is to show you a little bit about the history of how people conceptualize the stars and a little bit about how it changed a little. And the end point is what we do nowadays as observing astronomers uh, and how we observe things. But there is a history that got us from point A to point B. And I hope to cover some of that as well. And along the way, maybe you'll get a little better sense of how we came to observing the kind of stuff and why the star maps we see nowadays look the way they do. So what are star maps? Well, they're basically prints that show the location of stars in the heavens. And they use, because they're maps, they use a stellar coordinate system based on celestial latitude and longitude. Now bear with me on the terms, because originally it was called celestial latitude and longitude, taking its name from terrestrial maps and how people look at the Earth. Uh, the thing that's tricky is that these old star maps, some were oriented to the ecliptic and some were oriented to the equatorial system. Uh, the ecliptic is that area of the sky, as you look up, that the sun goes through. And so do the planets. And so does the moon. It's the area of sky about 8 degrees up and down where all the stuff in our solar system goes. And it's in a band because it's basically, if you look at the current events, it's basically the solar system. The solar system is a band. Most of the planets go around in a, in a band around the sun. And what we're looking from the Earth is that band. And it's called the ecliptic. Uh, so that's why uh, this is an important orientation system. Now, what do I mean by the orientation? The, um, oh, actually, you may, can you hear me in the back? Yeah, we are. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me better now? No. 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 Okay. This you like. Okay. Is this better? Yes. yes. Okay. So you, it's useful to think about two kinds of coordinate systems in the sky. One is oriented with, uh, to the sun's path in the sky, which is the plane of the solar system. And the other is based on the Earth's equator projected into the sky, okay? And it happens to be 23 and a half degrees separate because the Earth is tilted, okay? So there's two ways of examining. One is to see the sky as a great ball outside of us, and this is how the Greeks saw it. Great ball outside of us uh, with the ecliptic being the orientation point, which is ground zero of longitude, and the other is to look instead, not at those stars, but to look at the stars that go through an area 23 and a half degrees separate from that, is the projection of the Earth's equator. And I'll show you a diagram of that, then I think we'll make it clear. The other thing to keep in mind is, when you look up at the stars, the way they look, I call the geocentric orientation. That's the way the star constellations look as we look up. But there's another way of looking at it, and that's what I call the external which is to imagine the sky as a ball, and you're outside the ball like God, looking back. And that's called the external orientation, looking back from the heavens. Why is that important? Because some of the earliest star maps, going back, again, I'm talking about Western constellations, were globes carved in marble. And you couldn't get inside the marble to look up at the stars on the surface. You had to see it from the outside. So because of that, the, the ancients were used to seeing the constellations from the outside, which means they're left to right reversed. Now, those of you who observe in telescopes know about left and right reversals. I won't get into that tonight. But certainly, you, things can be reversed depending on the lenses and how you see it. Well, the orientation of the star maps were the same way. In fact, the oldest existing star map in the Western society is the Farnese Atlas. Uh, that's in Naples, at the museum in Naples, and it shows Atlas holding a globe that's a celestial globe. 
And what you see on the surface of it, looking back, are all the constellations, but the order is left to right reverse. And because of that orientation, a lot of the early star maps use that as their orientation of the, of the sky. Really confusing, but that's the way it is. All right, so this gives you a little better feeling for this stuff. This is, a, 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 this is an armillary sphere. That's an image of an armillary sphere uh, 15 from 1522 uh, edition of Ptolemy's Geographia. And it shows you kind of the diagram that I want you to kind of think about. Here's the Earth in the middle. Here's the horizon. So if you take the Earth's equator equinoctial point and you project it outward, this horizon is the equatorial horizon, and this is the equatorial pole 90 degrees away from it. Okay? But tilted 23 and a half degrees, it's not tilted, we're tilted. This is the this is the ecliptic, and 90 degrees away is the ecliptic pole. So you got one orientation of zero longitude. 90 degrees is the pole for the ecliptic. You got zero degrees of longitude for the equatorial system, and 90 degrees away is the equatorial pole. All right? I'm going to give you a test on this very, very soon. So be alert. Um, so that's kind of why there's these two weird orientations. Um, nowadays, which one do we follow? You observing astronomers, making observing astronomers work. What is zero? Is this the projection of the equator or the projection of the ecliptic? Equator. Equator. Okay? This is what we use now. But a whole bunch of early people use this. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. All right. So to concretize it, this is a nice star map. I like this because it's, it's, it's beautiful. Can you hear me? Am I fading out when I stand away? Okay. Just yell if I if you can't hear me. Um, this is from Zahn's uh, book published in 1696. It's one of my prints that I have. And what you see here is a pole in the middle, and you go 90 degrees, and here's the rim. All right? So zero, 90 degrees. The question is, is this an ecliptic pole or an equatorial pole? Is this the horizon of the Earth projecting outward, or is it the ecliptic circle? The way you can tell is you look at the constellations on the rim, and if the constellations are the zodiac, because what I didn't tell you yet is the ecliptic happens to also be where the constellations of the zodiac are. Now there's a good reason for it. The sun is magical to a lot of old, old cultures. The zodiac is magical to a lot of old cultures. And so the constellations through which the sun goes and the planets and the moon, all 12 of them through the course of the year, are the zodiac constellations. That makes it a little easier then to look here Anybody recognize any constellations here as being in the zodiac? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Here's here's Libra, here's Virgo, here's Leo. And these are on the rim. So you know that this line is the ecliptic, and this must be the ecliptic pole. Okay? Now, is this an external orientation or is this a geocentric? The way you can tell. There's a couple little ways to tell that are easy, and some of you who are observers will know Leo the lion's got an asterism, which is a question mark. If you see, turn your head a little bit this way. Turn your head, turn your head to, 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 so this makes sense. Here is the way the question mark goes. Does it look like a question mark? Does it go the right way or the opposite? Right way. Right way. If it looks the right way, it's, the, it's an external orientation. Another way is, here's the Big Dipper, if you turn your head, is this the way the Big Dipper is oriented, or does, it, does the handle come from the other side? It comes from the other side. Again, it's the external orientation. This is not the way these constellations look as you look up at the sky. Now, if you're really cool, and you know the order of the zodiac, you also know that Virgo is in, precedes Libra, if you know that. Not all of you know that. But it's really easy. You find a Big Dipper and it, on these maps. If the Big Dipper is looking the way you're used to seeing it, with the handle coming in from the left and coming down, you know, it, it rotates, but it always comes in from the, that side. 
then it's, it's geocentric. But this happens to come in from the right side. And the question mark looks like a question mark in allele, and that means also external, because really, Leo faces, when you look up at it, from the sky faces to the right, and the question mark is opposite. Okay? Now that concludes my talk for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> now we're experts in, in orienting your system. All right, so this is kind of the deal. Now I'm going to ask you more questions later, but I think, any questions so far? Because this is, once you get this, we'll zoom through the rest of the talk. That makes sense to you? Yeah. You know external, you know geocentric, you know which pole you're looking at by what, where the map shows it because of what's on the rim, and that center is the that appropriate north pole. Okay. We won't get to the southern pole because you know people don't know the southern constellations as well. This is enough. All right. So where do the constellations come from? I'm going to give because I don't have a whole lot of time to get into the cultural things, but just so you know, all the, every culture has their own set of constellations. Uh, the Chinese had, at one time, 240. Uh, the Egyptians had their own set of constellations. Well, I'm going to talk mainly about the Western tradition, because that's what we're most familiar with, and you astronomers who look through your, your, your star maps are going to see the, the, the Greco system. But the Greco system really didn't start in Greece. It started in Mesopotamia. About half of the Greek constellations are Mesopotamian in origin, we think. Because on clay tablets, you see references to the bull, and you see the, the lion and the scorpion. So we think that the Greeks borrowed about half of their 48 constellations from, the, from Samaria, basically. Uh, the other half they invented themselves. Anybody can invent a constellation if you're a power that be. You just look at the stars and you create what you think it should be and you put it in your atlas and from there on that's what it is. It created great problems later as I'll show you. But, so the Greeks had it and the constellations meant mythology, it meant, it meant navigation. Where the stars were were really important. It's your navigational system, it's your mythological system to teach kids you don't do the bad things, you cut the head off of Medusa and you're going to be in trouble. And you know, and you want to save, Perseus wants to save, you know, Cassiopeia. I mean, this is, it, it, the mythology is in the sky and planting. The first helical rising, the first star that comes up in the morning, every morning that you see this bright, is the helical rising star. And some of them, like Sirius, when that came up, it told the Egyptians, the Nile's going to flood, we better start planting. So the star positions are really important, which leads me to the point that I'm going to talk constellations, but it's not really what is important in star maps. It's the location of the stars, okay? Some of you will say, but the location of the stars are in the constellations, right? That was just shorthand. The Greeks, going way back, the ancient Greeks, had a system of the, of the, the heavens that were put all the stars in a system of, of longitude and latitude. So they were interested in where the stars were and so they had a grid in the sky that they mapped that showed this. We don't have that except I mentioned the Farnese Atlas, which is a 200 AD copy of the 200 BC Greek original. So the Greeks, when you read uh, the old writings, uh, you're not reading about the constellations. They're oriented, oriented in constellations, but that's not where the action is. They want to know where the stars were. They want to know the position of the stars so they could predict what was coming up when, where the North Star was, where they were going in the heavens to maneuver around. And because when you think about it, the constellation pictures, they can vary. You know, you put an arm over here and maybe you put the arm going this way. And in the manuscript era, every constellation image was a little different. But what wasn't different to the Greeks, who were great mathematicians, was the position of all the stars in a kind of a grid. It wasn't real accurate, but the, the, the whole world of star mapping has to do with mapping the stars, where they are in the heavens. So Ptolemy is, the, uh, is a good synthesizer. He lived uh, 100 uh, to 178 AD uh, in Alexandria, which was the center at that time of the Greek uh, Hellenic Empire. And he summarized the Greek mathematical astronomy in his book, Alma Guest. Uh, Ptolemy had three bestsellers. One was his Geographia. Those of you who are terrestrial map collectors know about Geographia. And he had the Earth, all, all the known countries of the Earth were plotted in, in his map system of the Earth in Geographia. 
Alma guessed was the equivalent of the sky. Very mathematical, a lot of angles and cosines and pointing to where things are. And Tetrabibos, which was his great um, astrological book. So those are the three bestsellers from Ptolemy, who was a great integrator of everything. And because we have some of his writings, uh, we know a lot about earlier Greek astronomy. He was actually influenced by a star map by Hipparchus. Hipparchus was a Greek astronomer in the BC era, had a star catalog. We think very similar to this, probably a thousand stars that were coordinated in a longitude latitude system based on the ecliptic uh, that Ptolemy wrote about, and he described 48 classical Greek constellations. And here they are. Here's an image of them in a later book. So here you see a map. This is taken from Ptolemy, and it has to do with the 48 Greek constellations. So you see a pole, and you see an edge. You see a funny line here. So what kind of orientation is this? What pole is this, the equatorial or the ecliptic pole? Look at the edge. Do you see any kind of zodiac constellations there? No. So you know that this is an equatorial. This is late. This is from 1795. And so by that time, people were using the equatorial system. Zero point was the equatorial pole. And here it is. And this is convenient because it also shows the ecliptic. 23 and a half degrees off. So where would the ecliptic pole be? 90 degrees away, probably about here. But this orientation is this. Now, the next question, is this geocentric? Is this the way the sky looks when you look up? Or is it coming from the outside looking back? Here's old Leo. And here's this question mark going the wrong way. And here's the tail of Ursa Major coming in from the left to form the Big Dipper. So it's geocentric. So this is a more modern, 1788, more modern star map showing oriented to the equatorial pole, and see the degrees. These are all degrees, 360 of them. And if you get a straight edge, 90, 90, this is 90 degrees. If this is one third of the way, then this star is located about 30 degrees. So it's a star map. You've got all the stars, and you can plot this with reference to this, and with reference to going out from this. It's a map. This is the southern hemisphere uh, of the Greek sky. And you see a lot of things here. You see uh, a lot of the Olus of Taurus, for example. And you see Argo Navis. And a big blank area. How come there's a blank area there? Well, they were there. The stars were there. The people hadn't been there. Because this is here is Alexandria, Alexandria's horizon. And nobody at that time had gone below Alexandria's horizon to see what was over here until the great explorers went down there. Were there constellations there? You bet. The Aborigines had constellations there. The, the Maoris the Maoris had constellations there. There were a lot of constellations for people who lived in the south. But to the Greek world, they didn't know what was there, so they didn't do it. And it didn't get mapped until later. OK. So moving on. All the Greek mathematical stuff went away in the Middle Ages uh, because a lot of the mathematical interest of positioning everything according to signs and code, you know, Euclid, we still read Euclid. He was an ancient Greek mathematician and he talked about angles and spherical geometry, and trigonometry. I mean, this is not new stuff. You go to school and you learn it, it's new to you. But this stuff is 2,000 years old and the Greeks used it to put positions of the sky. They had all kinds of angles and they could tell where things were. In the Middle Ages, though, people were not so interested and it fell by the wayside. Partly, part of the problem is the Romans weren't interested, especially. They borrowed the Greeks, but they didn't advance it much. They were more interested in building roads and conquering everybody. So their interest was in engineering, construction of roads, not so much in constellation. They just took the Greeks and just went with it. They didn't advance things very much. But in Islamic and Byzantine lands, the Greek constellation and, and mathematical systems were preserved in Islamic lands because Baghdad, they got copies of all the old texts and translated into Arabic. So they had a lot of the ancient Greek stuff that we don't have today translated, and they would work with the Greek system mathematically. And of course, in Constantinople, um, it was a Greek world. 
And so they had these things in Greek, and so they continued. So you see two pockets in the world of working with the different, where, the, where things were in the sky and how the earth worked and everything. And you know, it was all wrong because they had the earth in the middle. So they had to bend over backwards to make everything work. You have the earth in the middle, things don't go around like, like they are if the sun's in the middle. So they had to have angles and cycles on cycles rotating in different ways to make the mathematics work so they could predict where stars would be. They had a complicated system of epicycles and cycles spinning in different directions and they, until it worked. It worked fairly well, but it wasn't right because it was the wrong system. So the constellation images in the Middle Ages and the manuscripts and the early printed works were like this one. This is a manuscript 1499 from the Aldine Press. And it's a poem, uh, one of the ancient Greek poems here, the Cetus, the sea monster. And that's the diagram. Absolutely inaccurate. <laughs> because these are not maps. They weren't meant to tell you where the stars were. They were meant to be illustrations of the poem. So this is the kind of stuff you saw in the manuscripts of the Middle Ages. Here you got a bunch of stars in the belly, and you got some stars in the tail, and you got these fangs with no stars. I mean, it doesn't even approximate with the stars in, in Cetus. But they, didn't, they weren't interested in that in, in this part of our Western uh, history. They were more interested in just having a pretty picture to illustrate things. Now, when did the star maps come back again? Well, like everything else, they came back in the Renaissance. Because the Renaissance people were interested again in the writings of the ancients. A lot of these things were being discovered from various sources, uh, like Ptolemy's work, and were translated into Latin, and people would work on them. And so point zero started again as if the first many hundred years in between didn't exist with a new mathematical interest, new interest in plotting things, and, and so on. So that was one thing that helped. Printing helped a lot. Because in the old days with manuscripts, you do a manuscript, it's, a, it's a <coughs> one of a kind. You know, and your manuscript and your manuscript are different. And some monk makes a little mistake, and suddenly it's all different. Printing, you get replicability. Bango, bango, bango. Everything is the same, and you've got a bunch of them, and you distribute them to the scholars so they can study them. Discovery of new lands. You mentioned, Mary, that, that you know, when people went down finally in the age of exploration, they started looking and mapping and charting the skies in the south. Along with that came maps of the skies in the south that were created with constellations. There were advances in terrestrial mapping, such as going from really kind of crude wood blocks to copper engravings. And in a parallel way, the maps of the sky became more accurate. There's a lot of difference between carving a line in wood and etching it very finely on copper. Because you get a very fine line and you reproduce it from the copper plate you get a nice, beautiful line, whereas on woodcuts are very thick and they're, they're kind of clunky. So that made a difference. And after 1609, the telescope. And I'll get to the telescope impact on this mapping a little bit later. So the first star map was this one. Uh, there's actually a couple of others that are manuscript maps in museums that are, but, but they're one, one other kind. So they are star maps, and they're accurate, and they look kind of like this. But they're, they're really a manuscript. Oops, actually, I'll show you what it looks like. But the first map that was a printed one that could be reproduced was by Durer, the famous German artist and polymath. He did the first European star map, 1515. He had the constellations placed in a grid. So it's a map, because he had a radial grid with degrees. He used the polar, you don't need to know this, polar stereographic projection, and an oh, heck, I ruined it. It's an external orientation. I I was going to give you a test on this one, like on the globe, OK? And that's what it looked like. So what do we see here? We see a point. We see a bunch of constellations 90 degrees away. And you know that's the zodiac. So you know it's a, this is the zodiac, the pole, the ecliptic. Um, and then if we look at old Leo, you see the question mark going like a question mark. And you see the, the edge of the Big Dipper coming from the wrong way. So you know that this is an external orientation. You can tell that the first maps are, like I said, are external because the models they were using was on a globe that's made of marble coming from the outside looking back. Observational astronomy was not big in those days quite yet. So they could draw these maps the way they wanted to, and they were external, many of them. 
coming as if it's a globe and you're God looking from the back. But if you're used to looking up at the sky, and for old time's sake, because of the magic of the ecliptic, the sun goes through the ecliptic, and the zodiac is there, they would often have the ecliptic pole. So this is an old traditional system, the ecliptic orientation, external orientation, ecliptic coordinates. But degrees, 360 of them. And if you get your straight edge, this is 90 degrees you know. And you can say on your straight edge, if this is 1 half, that's a 45 degrees. And you can find where all these stars are mapped according to celestial latitude and celestial longitude. Okay. Piccolomini, not the famous Pope Piccolomini, but a related, a distant relative, uh, Alexander Piccolomini. He was only, I think, an archbishop. Uh, again, a polymath. For fun, if you want to do something kind of cool, if you're a little bit geeky, uh, he wrote, he wrote a, a play like Shakespeare. And you can find it on the internet. And it's a, it's a kind of a play, drama, and it's by Alexandro Piccolomini. So he had plays, he did other things, but he also did two books. One was a book describing the cosmology of the ancient Greeks, 1540, and the other one was the first printed star atlas. It's often bound together with this, the La Stella Physi. First printed star atlas shows accurately plotted constellation stars, but no figures. Just again, to show you, you don't need to have figures to do a star map. You need to have a grid system. And this is what one of his looked like. Do you recognize what this is? What's this? Ursa Minor? Well, Ursa Minore, just in case you read Italian. And this is Ursa Major. And here, you see the stars that were plotted with letters indicating where they were, and the size the magnitudes were how complex the figures were. So this would be what we would probably call, I don't know where the alpha would be, but this is the brightest and the second brightest. And a degree system here. So you know this is four degrees, so if you wanted to measure how far the stars were from each other, you could use this grid and you could tell how many degrees, about five degrees here. So it's a star map. It shows the location of the stars in the heavens. It also shows the magnitudes. And it also gives letters. This is a way back. I mean, you know, this is, Feinstein's not the first to do letters. They were doing this thing in, earlier than that. Okay, now what's the golden age? Golden age, from the 1600s to the 1800s, these things really took off. And they took off in beauty, in complexity, in degrees. They really honed in on sub-degree areas of the sky uh, because during the last half of this part, you had the telescope, and the telescope wanted to demand it that you could see things really in finer and finer increments because you could see more stars. So, and to me, there, there's the big four, uh, to me, are the most influential four atlases that were made in this period of time, which is the Golden Age. The first one is by Johann Mayer. Now, remember, there's no professional astronomers. Everybody did this for the love of the sky. Johann Mayer was an Oxford lawyer who happened to love the sky, wasn't paid a cent. To, to observe the sky, but did. And he came up with an atlas. He probably sold some atlases and made some money. The, his atlas was Uranometria in 1603. And he plotted the stars in a grid with a geocentric trapezoidal projection. Again, that, that, that's not too important here. And he included, this is, he was really up to date, the 12 new southern constellations that, the, that were hot off the presses. They would just come back about three years earlier from the, from the southern hemisphere. So he had, a, he, had, he had these constellations down there. His, he had 2,000 stars that were plotted, and he used Greek letters. So again, Flamsteed, you know, it's not the first to use letters, but we know that Piccolomini did it in the 1500s. This guy used them too, and that's an example of one of his star charts. And what you see are the degrees of latitude and longitude. You see the stars based on how big they are. So this star here is. Which star is this? Big star in Moody's? Arcturus, right? You get the Big Dipper, those of you who are observers will know, you follow the Big Dipper, the arc to Arcturus, and then the spike to Spica. Well, what we see, and I, I want you, to, I'm going over this, I have a couple of slides that refer to this. Here's Moody's, uh, here's the Big Dipper, 
So you see the handle going this way, and here's the bowl. So is this geocentric? Is this the way you look at it and look up at the sky? Yes. Yeah. Say it, you know it. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. Here we go. So now, so what you've learned, what you've learned now, you look at these maps, you know exactly what kind of orientation you have. From here, you really can't tell if it's, if it's, if it's oriented to the, to the um, which pole it is, but you know, that's okay. The main thing is, you see how this thing is organized? So this is the way the sky looks when you look up, but molten inside of a degree, tenths of a degree now, you're seeing the stars, are, are, there are more of them, and they're plotted sub-degree on this map. So we're getting better because the observing skills are better. Before the telescope, just barely, but they had all kinds of ways of looking at the sky uh, with, uh, and, and they, could, they could kind of tease out most of these are naked eye. All right, I mean, all, all were naked eye in those days. All right, Hevelius. Hevelius, again, not an amateur, he's a Polish son of a Polish brewer, made a gazillion dollars, but he didn't care about it. He just took the money and he built an observatory in Gdansk, Poland. Three houses, he built a huge platform roof. And on that platform, he had all kinds of instruments. He had a telescope. Uh, he had um, uh, all, all kinds of um, uh, uh, telescopes for looking at star position, uh, measurements for star positions, like quadrants and things where he would have on a wall. He'd have a quadrant measuring degree, and you'd sight it, and you'd see where one star was, how many degrees it was from the horizon, and then with another star, and you could tell the difference in degrees. He also had a printing press. What happened here? Here we go. Uh, he had a printing press and he had a, uh, a, 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 a mechanical laboratory, a mechanical tooling shed where he put things together. I mean, it was one-stop shopping with Hevelius. But he had the money and he could do this. And he was very, very, very well known. Even though he's a Pole, the British society knew him very well. And he communicated with Flamsteed and Haley and all these people. And he was considered a peer. Uh, very, very influential. For two reasons. Number one is he did the first ever lunar atlas, Solinographia, 1647. I'll show you a picture from that. And his star atlas, 1687, when he died, posthumously was published, uh, was Uranographia. But he was an old fashioned guy. He was an old fashioned guy. He thought, probably correctly, that the new telescopes were not quite accurate enough for star positions because. The lenses were smudgy and they had aberration and they weren't very good. So he didn't use his telescopes for positioning. He just used all these sight lines on various quadrants and so on to position all the stars in his atlas. And because he was an old-fashioned guy, he created this urinographia with an external projection, even though the telescope was starting to come into play. He also, though, included 11 additional constellations. He had 1,500 stars, and he preferred the naked eye. Do we have a ghost in here? I hope it would lose our power. Yeah, but that's his from Selenographia. That's the first lunar atlas. It's one of the plates from that. And you see the, the features on the moon. Uh, I doesn't have time. Very quickly, he made a mistake. He named all the features after Earth features. And how did he do that? Well, if you turn your head the right way, you see this. You can look at this as the Mediterranean Sea. And you can see this as Italy and Sicily. Sicily. Turn the other way, this way. And you can see, because he, he took the old idea that the moon kind of looks like the Earth, almost like a reflection. And he named everything in Latin after the Earth. And he had huge names, Mediterraneo and all these things. And so that's what he did. Riccioli, a monk, a Jesuit monk, a few years later, came up with his atlas of the moon, and he was very smart. He named the features after famous astronomers and personalities. So you have like Tycho Brahe is on here, you have you know, Copernicus, all these. Now, for 140 years, you see these two systems next to each other, because they're both famous. Uh, finally, it settled on one. Who do you think won out? I'll give you a hint. You're a famous astronomer. You're a famous astronomer. And you get to vote which one you're going to use. One of them is going to be, you know, a country on the Earth. 
and the other one's going to be another astronomer. And when you die, you might get your name on there. So who are you going to pick? Riccioli. Riccioli went out. 90-some percent, 96 percent of our current lunar features on the side we see are Riccioli systems. Poor Riccioli system has disappeared. Too cumbersome, too hard to pronounce, and no hope for all the budding new astronomers that they'd ever have a place on the, the moon named after them. Okay, this is Moody's again. This is his atlas, Hevelius. Again, the degrees of latitude and longitude. He happens to have booties with his back to us. See, that's why it doesn't matter. You can have booties facing us or with his back to us. The picture doesn't matter. It's the star positions. And these star positions are accurate. After all, here's Ursa Major, the tail, the arc, the Arcturus. But is this external or geocentric? Here's, here's, here's the, the tail, and here's the bowl. Is that the way you see it when you look up? No, it's an external projection. So if you look over here, here's booties coming in from the left, from the right, bang to Spica, nice picture of the Big Dipper. If you come over here, you go, oops, over here, coming from the other side, left to right, reversed, external versus geocentric. Okay? But it didn't matter so much because he was so accurate and he had a lot of new, uh, a lot of uh, subdivisions, and we get beautiful, beautiful plates, um, that he was still pretty famous even though he was kind of outdated when he first came out with this because all of a sudden people were more interested in geocentric because that's how the telescope works. Which brings me to John Flamsteed. John Flamsteed was one of the first professional astronomers. And actually, the uh, first astronomer royal in England uh, picked by Charles II uh, to create, again, an atlas of star positions. Why did it matter? All these ships were crashing into rocks because no one knew where they were in longitude. If you read that famous book on longitude, you'd know that. They could tell latitude because where's the North Star? How many degrees above the horizon? You know where you are on the Earth up and down. But left and right, you don't know because there's no orientation that you can use. There were ways of doing it, though, such as a table that showed you the phases of the moon or the phases of Galileo satellites at a certain day and time, as seen from England. And then you could see where it was as seen from you on the ship. And you could tell by the displacement where you were in longitude. But you had to know the stars accurately. Because what stars you were using to match what you were using in your table had to be very accurate. So his job, uh, by the way, the first, the first, um, the first uh, uh, Royal Observatory was in France, in Paris, and they had the same thing. They were trying to figure out longitude. So they were, they were his job, the Flamsteed, was come up with the most accurate star atlas placement of the stars ever so we can figure out where the hell we are in, 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 in longitude so our ships don't keep crashing into rocks because they don't know where they are. So there was a real political reason for this. Flamsteed was a kind of a curmudgeon. I'll, I'll tell you the story because it reminds me of the story. He was a curmudgeon. He was a perfectionist. He was cranky. Not a nice guy. And he took forever to do this. And everybody would say, where is the star uh, catalog you promised us and this atlas? They really cared about the catalog. They wanted to know celestial degrees, where everything was. Where are these things? Well, I'm getting to them. I'm rechecking them. I'm rechecking them. OK, Newton was going crazy. Newton needed to know star positions because he had some theories about the moon, and he wanted to prove them, and he needed an accurate catalog, and he couldn't wait. So he went to Haley, who was the secretary of the Royal Society, and said, i got to have this catalog. Haley pressured Flamsteed, who pushed back. They were not the best of friends. Uh, they got some, um, who was a duke, to say, you will do this. So Flamsteed said, OK, I'm not done. If you promise not to publish it, I'll give you a catalog, what I've got now, so that Newton can do a theory, which he did. He gave him this thing. So what did Haley do? He published 400 <laughs> copies. OK? Uh, Newton was happy. Haley was happy. Flamsteed was not happy. He found 300 of them in Burden. <laughs> and so probably one of the neat, rare collectibles, if you get a copy of these original things that his original catalog system is really important. But it shows you that scientists, even in those days, were fighting and hassling and cranky and, you know, a pain just like they are today. 
So, so this is, oops. All right, so. Uh, Astronomer Royale of England, 3,000 stars, so we're getting more stars now. Alice Celeste's was his book. My goodness, that's 10 years after he died. Who published it? His wife and two assistants. It took him so long that he died before he finished. So his wife and his assistants got together and they finished his calculations and double checked to make sure all the stars are in the right celestial latitude and longitude. And they published the catalog based on the equatorial and the ecliptic. Uh, well, based basically on the equatorial because he was a modern guy and the telescope was out. Now, telescopes. You got telescopes. One of the easiest things to do that you, you all know is you put your telescope and you set it where you want it to be and you go away somewhere and you come back and the sky moves and another star comes that you want to measure. And by the time it takes, you can measure the degrees between the two stars. So you can map the stars just by the sky moving. But you had to have a system that lets you do that. The celestial latitude and longitude didn't quite work that way, especially if it was oriented to the ecliptic. But you, you rotate it on the Earth's, Earth's axis with an equatorial system, and you wait. And so what now evolved is the system of right ascension and declination. Why do we have one's in degrees and one is in time, hours and minutes and seconds, because that's the way it was used early on. You wait a certain number of minutes and seconds for the second star to come into, into, your, into your image, into your view. And so the idea of having right ascension, which is up and down, basically longitude, uh, latitude, and, and declination, no, right ascension, which is in hours, and declination, which you see on modern star charts, came out of the telescope need to have time be an indicator of position. You go with me? Okay? So nowadays we talk about, you don't see celestial longitude and latitude, you see right ascension and declination from this history from, from here on, pretty much from here on. So his famous book was Celestis. Uh, Fortin, Atlas Celestis was big, bulky, hard to use as a telescope. So the French, Fortin, got the contract to redo the plates in a smaller, cleaner version that's called Atlas Celeste de Flamsky. Okay, it's really a second volume of this, but it's smaller, about a third smaller, in 1776. If you're a collector, and I, I maybe a couple of you will get interested in this, if you look up uh, your favorite you know, dealer, uh, Rutterman is in San Diego, he's got pretty good prices, and he's a, a West Coast guy. Doesn't have to pay the high prices that the New York map people do. If you look up, up you'll see maybe Flamsteed. Want to buy a Flamsteed print, it's only $1,500 or $1,800. That's the original. But you can buy a shorter version, smaller version from this that was published, many more of them, for about $200. But be careful. If it says Flamsteed and it's $200, you're not going to get an original Flamsteed. You're going to get the French version, plus you can read the French on it. Okay. So this is what it looks like. This is an original. This is an original Flamsteed. And here you see Orion and the belt. And that's the way it looks when you look at the heavens, so you know it's geocentric. And you see Monoceros. And here's, this, here's an equator. What do you think this is? Do you think it's the equatorial? Or the or the or the uh, uh, equatorial system or the ecliptic equatorial because this is going through something and these are not zodiac all right I mean zodiac view up here but you, you know that this is not where this would go uh, and plus I know that planet is this, that system but you see these heavy lines these heavy lines here are the celestial latitude and longitude that Flamsteed used. And look at this, but you see, already see the hours mentioned. This looks like a modern atlas. But for just to cover his bets, he included in smaller lines, tilted 23 and a half degrees, the equatorial system, the ecliptic system, the ecliptic system. So that's why it's a little confusing. You've got the heavy lines, perpendicular to the equator, that's the, the new system with its hours and, you know, and declination. But then he has these little other sides tilted 23 and a half degrees to kind of cover for those people who are used to that. I mean, he had to sell them, right? 
so this is a transitional atlas. It's the first major atlas, there's a couple minor ones, that used the uh, it said where it's centered on the equatorial system and actually had you know the kind of symbols that we're used to using. And this is actually a Flamsteed French. See the French language? And I show this because it shows you the pole, the two different poles, the, the uh, equatorial pole and the ecliptic pole, 23 and a half degrees separate, if you didn't believe me. Because remember, the original Flamsteed had both systems in them. This shows you the upper one. The, the, the original Flamsteed plate of this was just the same step as bigger. But you can see the two systems coexisting. All right. Bode. Bode was the director of the Berlin Observatory. This gets me to the end of my big period. Uh, 1801, he came out with the Uniographia. Bode did a, a gazillion atlases. Some were right after, from Flamsteed, and some were not. Um, but the Uniographia is the epitome of star atlas hood because it was the largest ever made. It had over 17,000 stars. The telescope was, was rampant in those days when he did this, so he could see a lot of stars. 100 constellations and asterisms, and he used a ge geocentric orientation again because he was a telescope guy, all right? Why did he have so many constellations? Because he could. <laughs> you do an atlas, you put anything you want in there. Now how nice it is if your sponsor for your observatory is Frederick the Great, well you put something for Frederick in there, and that's what he did. The trouble is, it gets really cluttered, and it looks like this. So here you see, it's a little bit different. It's a hemisphere, but it's not oriented on a pole. It's actually oriented on the, um, uh, I think it's the vernal equinox. I'm pretty sure. I'm sorry sure. about the lights. Like, I don't, I don't know what's going on. We have a ghost in the city. We're going to do lights. Okay. Would you like well, to go all dark or all on? Because this is probably um, Let's try let's try Mohan first. All right, Mohan is hopefully let's stay on. I, is, I, that, is that okay? Because yeah, yeah, some of you are okay. lighting and you know. Yeah. Uh, all right. So it's centered on That's the. Okay. Go. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, I think the vernal equinox. And here you see, here you see, the ecliptic line and the equatorial line crossing. And where they cross is right here, which is the first point of Aries in this map. All right, I'll show you a blow up. But look at all the constellations. So here they go. You have the two lines here. Here is Aries. This is the ancient one. Before procession knocked it out of the way, this, these, this crossing was right here. Procession is knocked it out of the way, and now the age of Aquarius, the age of Aquarius, we're heading towards Aquarius, and this line is going to move here, the crossing point, because of precession of the Earth. You know what precession is? The Earth wobbles. 23,000 years, it wobbles like this. And as it's wobbling, it, everything shifts in the sky, and so these lines cross. So that's why you see here. So here you see Honoris Frederici, Frederici you see the crown of Frederick the Great, who is sponsoring the Great Observatory in Berlin, and he gets a lot of glory points when he goes and says, look at this, I'm honoring you, and oh, by the way, I'd like another 10,000 you know, marks for my observatory. This is fun, hot air balloon. <laughs> there were a couple stars here, and so what are you gonna do? You put a constellation there. Why a hot air balloon? Well, the, the, the uh, Gaultier brothers, Montgolfier brothers in France were hot air balloonists, and there was a big vogue at the time was hot air ballooning. So what are you going to do in your map? You put a hot air balloon, and there it is right there. All right, I'm going to talk fast now. A few, just a few others. Schiller is kind of fun because Schiller said, contemporary of, um, uh, of uh, Bayer, uh, he was a lawyer also, and he said, you know, we have all these primitive, this is, this is Catholic Europe, we have all these primitive constellations, I'm going to Christianize the heavens. So he came up with his atlas, this one here in 1627, the north, all the constellations were named for the New Testament, 
All the southern constellations were, were named for things in the Old Testament, and the zodiac were the 12 apostles. And he thought, this is what we're going to do, so he created this. You recognize this constellation? Here is the Big Dipper, the Ark to Arcturus, so this is Booties. Booties, that's Booties. It's really St. Sylvester, who baptized, I think, I think he baptized uh, John the Baptist, I think. But anyway, so you see, we got angels, we got arcs, we got saints. That's what we do. It didn't take off. I'm surprised this didn't take off in Catholic Europe. I didn't think it would. People said, that's nice, isn't it cute, but let's go back to the old system. <laughs> Solarius, I mentioned Solarius for, for uh, arguably doing the most beautiful atlas ever done. Uh, nothing new, he, but it was well done uh, in 1660. Who likes this? These are very expensive if you're going to buy these things. They're four to five thousand dollars for a print. Why? Because interior decorators and boards of, of uh, company boards love to put these on their walls because they're pretty and it shows you're kind of hip and you're kind of a scholar if you put one of these prints and this is what they look like. And they're absolutely gorgeous. You see the pooty and you see the flying around, you see nice pictures. Uh, a lot of these were colored originally, and you see little, you know, they're just gorgeous things. So the Solaris is kind of expensive, but, but I mentioned it because a lot of people will want to have a Solaris, especially if they've got a lot of money. <sighs> Doppelmeyer, German, precise, got together with, with Homan, produced some very good and very accurately done star atlases, including 1742, again, geocentric, because they have the telescope. This is an example of one of his pictures. I'll just mention everything about 1742 astronomy is here. You've got eclipses. You've got the Earth, uh, the uh, California's an island down here. You've got the sun with the relative size of the planets. You've got the Copernican system in the middle with the zodiac along the rim. And you've got exoplanets. You think exoplanets are new? I know, I, actually they were done, people were talking about other planets around other stars in the 1600s. Bruno, Bruno was burned at the stake for preaching other stars, other star systems, because the church didn't like that. He was also kind of a cranky guy. You know, gotta be a nice personality if you're gonna be a little bit eccentric. But look at this. We have all these star systems here that were shown in the heavens. So exoplanets were thought about a long time ago. And then this is one of his star charts. These are the constellations with degrees of longitude and latitude uh, along the side. Okay, they all went away with telescopes. Another influence of the telescope, you saw size changing orientation, was you're looking at things that are bigger and bigger telescopes that are fainter and fainter, and an eyeball of a constellation could be misconstrued as a deep sky object. So they cluttered the, the use of these star maps for telescopic use as telescopes got more sophisticated. Plus with micrometers and photographs, the same thing, you didn't need to have images anymore. So there's less need for them. And so the International Astronomical Union got together in 1922 at their assembly and they said, look, first of all, we have too many constellations. They clutter it all, we can't use them. Let's go back to 88, the original Greeks, plus a few of the old classic ones, and that's it, and the whole sky, and second, Let's not call the constellations by the image, but by the area of the sky. That's why when you look at a map, you'll see lines. And this is Leo. And it doesn't matter what's inside Leo, it's the line that represents the area of the sky that has the Leo's constellations. Right next to it is the next constellation. So the, uh, the sky now, by Delaport, he drew up the official boundaries in 1930. So by committee, just like Pluto got left by committee, by committee, the sky was set up in the 88 areas of the sky that had the names and the kind of the sense of the old days, but didn't need to have the constellation pictures, but they had to have the area of the sky. So every chunk of the sky is in one of these constellation areas, okay? So the constellation images got subdued, and then they got to be connected lines, and then no images, going, going, gone. So here you have a German atlas, I think it's 1904, and you hardly see the constellations. What you see here, oh, I'm sorry, 1875, sixth edition of Steeler's Hand Atlas, 
And you see a few constellations here in the corner for the zodiac, but all these in the middle pretty much are just stars and nebulae are starting to come in. And then here's another one. This is uh, Dien and uh, uh, Dien and Flammarion, 1904. And so all you see is the major constellation asterisms are shown to give you a feeling of what's there. So here's Leo, here's the belt of Leo, and this looks like a sky and telescope for astronomy Orion. insert. Orion. Orion, I'm sorry, Orion. This is like an insert in Sky and Telescope in Astronomy Magazine. They still do that for us to give us a little bit of a feeling of the, of the old days. But look at all the stars. So what counts is you don't see any constellations here. I'm going to conclude with a few comments on contemporary star outs for those of you who grew up with these things like I did. Who has used Norton Star Atlas? The whole, only a few? Oh, it got old, it got old some of us here. All right, this is, a, this is the Bible, the biblical atlas of the old days, all naked eye, by Norton. Started in 1910, he had two hemispheres, six cores, geocentric, great for observing. 6,500 stars, mainly naked eye stars, and 600 nebulae. Now we're getting nebulae shown in there, because we don't have images, so we get nebulae, we have all kinds of cool things, because of the telescope. And, to give them credit, they kept up with the times. The fifth edition, they used the IAU boundaries I talked about. So suddenly, you see lines in the, in, in the fifth edition dividing the sky into 88 segments. And the 19th edition, they used a computerized typesetting system. So they kind of kept up. The reason this is so popular is it did kind of keep up, but it's good for the beginner, and it's wonderful, and it looks like this. So this is an example. I think this is mine. 17th edition, 1978, here's the Milky Way, and here is Orion the Belt. No lines, no nothing, except you recognize it. So pay attention to this, I'm going to show this now as my framework. There you go, the belt, and see the lines? So that's one constellation, right next to it is another one. They're all oriented by area of the sky, not by a figure. Just so happens that Orion's got a nice figure in it, but some of these other stars aren't part of it, but they're part of the Orion area. So they're counted as Orion. Bekvar. So who used Bekvar? All oh, right. Uh, fewer people. Founder and director of Scalmi Plus Observatory in Czechoslovakia produced four star atlases. The most important was the Atlas Selly in 19, Atlas Selly 1950. It was published in 1948, but the stars were positioned two years in advance. So that you buy the atlas, you're a little bit off, ah, but you're right on two years later, and it goes longer. So you have a, an impetus to buy this thing. 32,500 stars. Now we're getting to non-naked eye stars because the telescope, these are used for telescopes, and because of that, they go to magnitude 7.75. Much more useful than, than the one I just showed you. Plus, you've got multiple and variable stars. There was some east-west squeezing. There was an inaccuracy, though, that sometimes just made it difficult to find things. And probably those of you who have used it used the U.S. edition in 1949 and 1958. So there was an edition done in this country. That's what it looks like. Looks pretty good. And there is Orion getting bigger because the area of the sky is now smaller because we're showing more stars. And there's Orion, and you see right there the nebula, and you see the sword. Okay, Tyrion. Tyrion, when he had the scene, he was very famous because he was a uranographer. His, his whole life was making maps of stars, and he produced a bunch of atlases. Two that are notable, Sky Atlas 2000. Some of us remember when that hit, hit the press, it was a big deal, because it was published in 1981, centered around the year 2000. So you could have this thing for 20 years and it only increased in accuracy. So he plotted the stars as if they would look at the year 2000. Uh, and became very accurate. 43,000 stars, 26 charts. So more charts, smaller area of the sky, more stars, better to use the telescope, down to magnitude 8. Plus 2,500 deep sky objects because amateurs were using the deep sky more. And it also corrected back for his distortion. But, you know, he had to make money somehow, so he came up, well, so this is how it looked. This is what it looked like. Here's Orion. 
and this is the nebula, and there's a little insert expanding on the nebula. For those of you who love to look at the Orion Nebula, there it is. And then you have, the, you, know, you have other areas of the sky that you thought were different gases and so on. But you see the lines indicating that's the Orion. But he did another one. He did Uranometria 2000, even more accurate with George Lo Loby. Two volumes, 1987, 1988. So you thought you got away with buying just one, right? You're good to 2000. No, no, I got a better one. You got to buy this one now. Uh, first computer generated atlas for the general observer. Advanced over previous hand plotted 473 plates in two volumes. 332,556 stars to magnitude 9.5 and 10,300 deep sky objects. Well, I want to go out and buy this thing. You know, this is really going to be cool. Much better than the other one, even though the other one is getting more accurate every year. And it looked like this. So you can see, now Orion's getting pretty big because this is a smaller area of the sky. He's got these things in magnitudes. Of the, in, in every magnitude's got a, a different circle. Here's the belt, and there's Orion Nebula. Pretty accurate, very nice. But we're not done yet. The Millennium Star Atlas by Roger Sinop and Michael Perryman, three volumes, 1997. Anybody buy this? Okay, here's a tip, good for you. But you, if you run home tonight, you get on eBay. You look up all these things and you can still buy them. They're collectible, they're 30 bucks maybe. You can buy these atlases. I have all these I'm showing you from my collection because they are 30 bucks here, 40 bucks. And you can relive a little bit of astronomical history, if you like, on eBay with these things. But this one's based on a satellite. Never mind just a simple computer. ESA Hipparchus satellite generated a bunch of maps by computer, and he turned them into this document. 1,548 charts, 1 million stars to magnitude 11. Now, that'll do you as an amateur, won't it? <laughs> 10,000 non-stellar objects. Galaxies are correctly oriented in position, and not just a symbol, they're actually there. And the star dot size is related to star magnitude by a power law. So you can have third magnitude, 3.1 magnitude, 3.2, and the size changes a little bit with each one because they could do that with a computer. And it looks like that. Here's Orion's belt. <laughs> You can see it's pretty, pretty, pretty trim. I mean, the whole thing is Orion's belt, pretty much. And you can see all these really faint stars in the grid system with the right ascension declination on the side. And here's some of the sizes to give you a feeling of them. Pretty good, pretty good uh, atlas. Nowadays, people use computerized atlases. And, and how many of you have go-to telescopes? Oh, you lazy people. Okay, so. Nowadays, it's easier because a computer does the work. You don't have to look at these. Uh, but for decades, computers were only used to guide professional telescopes. And in the 80s, they started becoming part of amateur telescopes. And when you bought a telescope, you buy it with a computer already installed. Didn't really up the price, maybe a little bit for the first few years. But then they kind of settled in. Almost a computerized telescope is the same as one without a computer. Uh, the go-to systems reduce the need to star hop. Uh, and you have your personal devices. You can pull them out and you can get a gazillion apps uh, that you can use to find star locations on that. Uh, so the results, I think, are maybe observers are less familiar with the sky in terms of having a feel for the sky and where the constellations are in, in their glory. Uh, and the mythical connection has been lost with uh, the ancients with the, the loss of the constellations. But these are the telescopes, these are the maps the star maps that are needed for modern day amateur observing. So they're really needed and they're, they're useful. Um, and so that's how we have now evolved. Uh, some of the mystery is gone, but the accuracy is there. Okay, so this is uh, the, the, the book, Star Maps is over here, the third edition, hardback, and then that's the solar system mm -hmm. maps, which is a sequel, deals with solar system mapping the planets in, in the heavens. And that should do it.
years or 100 years? Or, you know, they, because of the recession, they want to yeah. sink. Is it important? Is it, yeah. Do I care? I'm already. Well, <laughs> no, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're 10 years old, yeah. You probably would update them every 20 years or so just to kind of keep up. Uh, but the computer, I'm sure that some of the, some of the oh, apps yeah, probably do it for you. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I bought several of these. I never bought, I, I bought the, the Cherry on and I bought had the original. But I didn't buy the Millennium. I have it now because I collect these things. But I never used it. But I'd say probably every 20 years. But if you have a computer and you have a go-to system, yeah. you don't need to do that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, well, my question was, so I noticed that throughout uh, the passage of your lecture, like the Mesopotamian says, one interpretation, the same constellations they all got. I can't hear you, Dick, but. Like, the Mesopotamian is one interpretation of being different, and then the Easterns had one interpretation, and the Western had one interpretation. And what I was wondering was, uh, say you just had, like, um, a little thing like with all the stars drawn out, with no lines and no shapes or anything, could you like actually uh, draw the shapes around it? Because it, I thought that might have actually worked pretty well. So you, you draw the shapes from? Like create your own constellation? Basically, yeah. Well, That's the problem is you want to communicate with other fellow astronomy, amateur astronomers what you're seeing. I mean, seeing. I'm not used to like a big lecture or anything, just for fun, you know? Oh, for fun, you could do it. You could invent your own. You could invent, go home and invent your own constellations. And why not? You know, if something nice happens to you, you could have one designated uh, SFA anus, and that's the one that you have to the telescope. And you have a little telescope in the corner that matches your new telescope, and the, the, the donation to SFA, and you know, you can do your own constellation. And see, you do your map. You can do what you want on it. It's your map. Any other questions? Yeah. You mentioned a bunch of different projection systems like throughout the history. Um, is there a standard projection map system? Um, I do that for my, when I give the lecture to, to map, map people. Basically, all these, all these projections are inaccurate because you can't do three-dimensional images on two dimensions. And they all have, they all, they all have problems. And everyone thinks they have a better system. And they may be better in some ways, but not others. But like the conic projection that Bode used, he thought it was basically, imagine it was like a cone stretched out. And he thought that was more accurate, except it didn't do well north and south. The Mercator projection, we all know, does not do well. Greenland is huge, and Antarctica is a monster. So when you go to the poles, it's inaccurate. It's great for the mid-zone. So if you travel in the mid-zones, and you know, if you're Europe and America, you know that you care about your country. So they're all inaccurate in their own way. The Flamsteed projection was interesting. Flamsteed has a sinusoidal thing. I didn't mention this, but the lines, the, the, the lines that you see are actually the, the middle line is straight and the others are slightly sinusoidal as you go away. And that was supposedly to correct for the Earth's being round when you go that way. So he thought his projection was more accurate in placing the stars. They're hard to draw because you have to then, you can't just draw it flat. You have to draw it taking in mind the, the mathematics of the kind of the direction of projection goes. But they all, in their own way, fail because the sky is a round object to us. And you can't draw it as a flat surface. Just like the Earth is round, you can't draw it on the flat surface either. Mercator is really inaccurate, but it's really easy to use. In for uh, not for um, uh, navigators at sea because they just care about the middle, the middle temp, you know, the middle equator in north and south. And for there, it's great. You go straight edge and you can find your direction. So it has that advantage. They're all different and they all have weaknesses. Yeah. Is there a printed uh, uh, star map from the moon? From the moon? Yeah. Uh, the astronauts did a lot of a lot of photographs, and there's a lot of NASA really nice lunar images uh, that are very accurate and very close because they did them as they went around the moon. And you can just look up NASA, Google NASA and lunar images, and there's a whole bunch of maps that you can get that were done from the images there. Those are the best if you really want to see 
accurate placements of the moon. Uh, but there's a lot of them that, that are from it, the way we see it as astronomers, and they're all pretty good. Is that, is that your question? No, I'm saying if you're on the moon and you look at the heavens, uh, is there a map, a printed map of that? I have a book that uh, was done by Flammarion in 1910, I think. I didn't bring the slides. And actually, it's in my second book, the, the, the Solar System. He has a bunch of maps of the what you're going to see in the heavens from the surface of Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. So needless to say, if you're on Mars, you see these two bright objects that are the moons of Mars. And they're the ones that are close. And, and, and so if you were an ancient on Mars, how would you draw a map of the solar system? We draw a map uh, from our perspective, the sun in the middle, the Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and so on. If you're Ptolemy, and you believe the sun's in, the Earth's in the middle, then you have Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Mm -hmm. And this, these maps in Flammarion, he's got the sun is in the middle. No, Mars is in the middle. You got Demus, Phobos, and so on. And so he actually drew the perspective from different planets of what it would be like to see the the the, the, uh, the, the planets. It's really kind of interesting. The stars in those days, yeah, not the stars. Not, the, not I don't know of any of the stars. I mean, I, I, um, in the early days, of course, the map of the cosmology was basically a solar system map, and then a big, the the stars, and others, you know, one one circle of of stars. But I don't know of any map of the stars that actually do that. But I'm sure if you Google if you Google that, you'll find it. You know, when you go and see a, a Star Trek or something. And, Wherever they are, they have a map of it. So I'm sure that there's some of the computer-generated maps of what it would be like, like from the perspective of, of the moon, what the sky would look like, the deep sky. Would it look any different than it does from the Earth? Do what? Would, would the sky from the moon look any different no. than it does from the Earth? Well, it'd be a lot brighter. You could certainly see a lot of... A, a lot mean of the map? The map would uh, not a whole lot, not a whole lot because the stars are so far away that the parallax wouldn't be much of a difference. Uh, probably even, I would guess, I don't know this for sure, but I would guess even from you know, Mars, the deep sky wouldn't look a whole lot different. The planets would be different, but the, the orientation is fine. Yeah. Yeah. I would just mention that if you're out there at night and you don't have any electronics I'm with sure. you, because then, yeah, a great thing is the Edmund Scientific um, Mag. It used to be Mag 5 star atlas, now it's Mag 6, and a bunch of us grew up on it yep. because it was the first, also, simplest uh, one to use. It's really easy. And the Astro Scan? Yeah, yeah. the Astro Scan. Yeah. 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 Um, since um, yeah, someone with good vision can resolve deep sky yeah. objects, um, were there any early maps of antiquity that had deep sky objects represented on them? Well, you can see you can see the sixth magnitude with great vision in a great sky, and even the Pleiades. You know, some people think there were seven. I mean, there are more than you know. There are most of us can see six. Under great, great like conditions. the Orion Nebula or Andromeda yeah. Galaxy? Uh, you can see a few. You can see Andromeda with the naked eye. Uh, I think you can see Orion Nebula. Is that right? I think. Yeah. 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 You can see some things with that just kind of as little vague smudges with the naked eye. And then the the, 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 the deepest object is Andromeda. You can see another galaxy, barely. So were there any, any maps of antiquity that rendered these? Well. Um, there's some, there's some thought, for example, that Flamsteed, one of his, he wrote about seeing something, and there's some question that one of his stars is really Uranus. Um, but I don't think way back people were mapping the deep sky objects really until the telescope came in. You could see the smudges. I mean, I don't know of anybody who called the Andromeda galaxy, you know, a star as far back as 1500s. You certainly see the Milky Way. The Milky Way, you can see. So you can see things like Colsat. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, look at Galileo. I mean, Galileo exploded everything because when he looked through his telescope, you know, he could see 
gazillion stars compared to what they could see before. And it's a revolution. It wasn't just the moons of Jupiter. It was all the stars he saw. And it created a whole idea of the nebula. They used to think all the nebulae were just clusters of stars that were so small that you just couldn't quite make them out. So they looked gaseous. And the whole fight in the 1900s was, you know, what is a nebula? Is it gas or a star grouping? And now we know it's both potentials. I mean, now we call nebulas gas. But in those days, it was clusters as well that could just barely be seen. So as the telescope got better, it changed our whole thinking about everything. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you.